I'm going to um, try to put some finishing thoughts, maybe finishing, on spiritual warfare. We've been talking about that for um, several weeks. Now, spiritual warfare is not abstract. Spiritual warfare isn't like I study spiritual warfare now, warfare, now I understand it. Spiritual warfare is actually something you do and something you're involved in. I want to say in Ephesians, we started this last month, say finally with me. Finally. finally. This is a final word in Ephesians 6.10 where he uh, is talking. And what the reason he says finally is because in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, he's talking about the blessings of redemption. And he goes through all the wonderful things God's done for it. In Ephesians 2... He's also talking about our salvation being saved by grace uh, through faith and not of works lest we boast. In Ephesians 3, he talks about our inner man before God that he does exceeding abundantly beyond anything we can imagine. He gets to Ephesians 4 and he's talking about the church. The church is to build itself up in love. He gives apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the building up of the body in Ephesians 4, and he, he explains that. Um, it's not the pastor that builds up the body. It's the body that builds up the body in love. The pastor equips the body for the body to build itself up in love. Say it's not the pastor. We can't fire the pastor. We can only fire the body. <laughs> Just kidding for our guests. Uh, Ephesians 5 gets into marriage. Wives, respect your husbands as to the Lord, and husbands, love your wives as your own bodies. And so you get to Ephesians 6, and I'm going to read this to you because I want you to understand when you talk about spiritual warfare, you do not negate the character and formation of God in all these areas, your personal relationship with God and all of this is leading up to where 
I'll get to finally, but I want to start with Ephesians 6.1. Children, can I hear children out there? Oh, man, weak, weak, weak. If you were a child at one time, echo it back. Children, Children. (laughs) obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that they may be well with, things may go well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, or we can say workers, or employees, be obedient to those who are your masters, your bosses, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in the sincerity of your heart, as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves to Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And bosses, masters, do the same things to them and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven and there's no partiality with him. Verse 10, finally, say it with me. Okay, we've covered your marriage, your kids, your job, your church, your culture, and now we're at finally. You can't ignore any of the things we talked about. We're having a marriage advance uh, next weekend because marriage is so important. It says marriage is like Christ in the church. If marriages are unhealthy, the church is unhealthy. It's that simple. If marriages are unhealthy, the kids are unhealthy. If the kids are unhealthy, then they grow up to be unhealthy adults and tend to reproduce the same things their parents did unless we break the chain through the grace of God. He says, finally, in verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor. We've talked about that that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes, which means there are schemes out there right now to destroy each one of us. And something that would work on you won't work on me. Something that will work on me won't work on you. The enemy is very selective. He knows how to get to different ones of us in different ways. But the similarity is that the schemes... Of their schemes of the devil, for we struggle or we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We are wrestling against something invisible. Well, I don't believe in anything I can't see. Okay, do you believe in Australia? (laughs) If you haven't been to Australia, do you believe it's there? Do you? You've never been there. Many of you have never been there, but you believe it exists, but you've never seen it. Why do you believe it? Well, my teacher told me Australia exists, and my teacher had a map of Australia, and other people have talked to me about shrimp on the barbie, and and, uh, (laughs) they say that it really exists. Crocodile Dundee is a real person. So how do you know that God exists? Well, other people for 2,000 years have told me about his miracles and have told me he's in his heart and have told me that he's transformed their lives and he's transformed entire cultures. And it's all written down, the whole genealogy from the beginning of Adam all the way and and from Matthew on the way back. It's not a fairy tale. That's why we know I would say this especially to the high schoolers today. The scheme for you guys is he's absolutely trying to undermine your faith, make you doubt at every level he can. And I'm looking, I think God's looking for those that remember the creator in the days of their youth. God's got his hand on you, and I really pray that some of you are going off to college next year and different things, but stand firm. 
Stand firm against the schemes of the devil. A boyfriend can be a scheme. Sorry. A girlfriend can be a scheme. A party that you should, can be a scheme. A person you really like but doesn't really believe what you believe can be part of a scheme. Don't be deceived, brethren. Bad company corrupts good morals. There's a proverb that says, don't uh, hang around a man given to much anger unless you too become angry. There's all these warnings. Now, it's not we're to be in the world, not of it. We're to be with, certainly we all are sinners. It's not like we're judging people for having some kind of issue, but it is important that we stand firm against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And then he says, after we've put on the full armor, resist the evil day, and having done everything else, stand firm. What's the opposite of standing firm? Flipping out. <laughs> I've seen so many people flip out over COVID. If you've been a flip out her, I don't condemn you. I don't. And I'm not even, even, I know it's, it's, it's a real thing and it's been a very terrible thing throughout the world in our culture. But the fearful flee when no one's pursuing you. No one's even after you, but you're running. We're running. But the righteous are as bold as a lion. I think good stewardship and decisions that each person makes is appropriate. But I will tell you this, you don't have another breath that God doesn't give you and me. No matter what we do. I eat a lot of bran. I take Pro Tandem, according to Aaron. Those are good vitamins. Uh, Aaron should be a vitamin salesman. She is. She's unbelievable. She's, now she's got me on Axio. And Kate can give testimony about that. But it's, it's like, it ain't going to add to my days. My times are in his hands. It can affect the quality of your life and different things. So here it is. Finally, the whole the thing about the armor, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. I'm not going to go back over that today. Today, but I uh, now we put it on because we're going out into the battle. Um, 1 John 3, 8, if you'd bring that up, just that one verse, I'd like you to see one of the key reasons that Jesus came. For one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose. Hmm. To destroy the works of the devil. And part of his works is, it says that um, Satan has blinded the hearts of the unbelieving. He's got these schemes going on in different places. He's known as the accuser of the brethren. So, if you've ever felt like you really have an accusatory thing going on in your spirit, you just, everything, and it's, it's there. More often than not, it's the enemy feeding something. He accuses other people. He doesn't accuse you. He accuses you for being mistreated or ill-informed or something like that. But he's the accuser. He's the deceiver. And he's a liar. He's a murderer. He is demonic. And he wants to neutralize you in any way he can. If he can make you a nice person that doesn't serve God, he's happy. It's better, off, it's better than you actually uh, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul. It's better than you feeling like you're called of God to do something. When you're called of God to do something, you're responding to God himself. You're not responding just to the pastor or just to Christianity. It's like, God, what would you have me do? Those kind of people get kind of dangerous. 
because they're responding to God, and God is calling them. Each one of you has a call on your life. You're not going to necessarily be me and pastor and preacher or Pat the singer or Jason the doorman put our doors in. <laughs> it was a gift. <laughs> Jason, you did it. You know why we got the doors up so fast? You don't get it. How many have heard about the supply problems and the boats? You know, off the, you couldn't get anything. And Jason, I was talking to Jason. He said, yeah, we got... I said, Jason, I want you to do this as unto the Lord. He said, uh. Once that happened, I mean, they were up in just a couple weeks, right? And not, not that you weren't doing it in the beginning. Okay, I'm not. I'm, I'm, all right. No, you love Jason. Okay, I want to talk a little bit, too, about something that I rarely talk about this in terms of spiritual warfare, but I want to talk about the occult. I pray that there's nobody in here that reads um, palm reading or seances. We have a place right here in Mission Viejo now, or, or anything that is um, not of God. It's from the pit of hell. It's another form of direction. The astrology columns are in every paper. So what are you? Oh, I'm a Leo. Oh, good for you. And we all say, I'm like you. I'm like, no, it's a bunch of bad stuff. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. <laughs> he saved me again. <laughs> Spirit of the Lord. Okay, listen to this. De De Deuteronomy 18, uh, beginning in verse 9. Can you bring that up? You can follow along as I read. When you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to imitate the detestable things of those nations. They shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, one who uses divination, or who practices witchcraft, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who casts a spell, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For whoever does these things is detestable to the Lord. I don't ever want to be that. The Lord your God will drive them out before you. You shall be blameless or complete. or It means you, you shall have integrity before the Lord your God. For those nations which you shall dispossess, listen to those who practice witchcraft and the diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do so. Go over to chapter 20, verse 1. in Deuteronomy. Now, here's an interesting scripture. When, not if, but when you and I go into battle against your enemies, the only enemy I have is enemies of Christ, and I'm wrestling against a spiritual enemy. Anybody that's an enemy of Christ is a human being. I need to be redemptive towards them and try to help them understand how much God loves them. Battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you. In other words, the odds are against us in some of the circumstances we're going to face spiritually. It's not a sure thing when you get into conflict with someone. It's not a sure thing when you do the right thing. It could backfire. You could be vulnerable. You could be undone. There's a risk. There's faith involved. Don't be afraid of them, for the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt is with you. Hallelujah. Say, is with me. That's everything. I'll never leave you or forsake you. Even to the end of the age, I'm with you most of the time. He's with us always. When you approach the battle, 
not if you approach it. The priest shall come near and speak to the people. He shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, you are approaching the battle against your enemies today. Do not be faint-hearted. By the way, this is a real battle. People are actually going to get killed that day. This isn't a story you learned in some, uh, Sunday school. They actually have on garments, and the people on the other side are not trying to negotiate with them. They're trying to kill them. And they're outnumbered. And he says, don't be faint-hearted. That doesn't sound fair. He's trying to get it through our thick heads that he's with us. And not to look at all the other stuff, but look at him with you in every situation. Through my God I shall do valiantly. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You'll never leave me or forsake me. You're the author and finisher of my faith. I love you, Lord. You're with me in this. I don't want to do this, but okay, you've got me in this fix to fix me, to fix somebody else, or fix me. You're approaching the battle against your enemies today. Don't be faint-hearted. Don't be afraid or panic. Or tremble before them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. That's amazing stuff. This is how the world gets turned upside down. Twelve apostles, one commits suicide after stealing from the treasury. The leader denies him, and the rest scatter. That's how you start a great, successful organization. <laughs> there was no St. Peter's in Rome. There's not all those beautiful cathedrals in Italy and Germany and stuff. It was just these men, and he said to them, follow me. Make sure you're a Presbyterian, though. <laughs> Make sure you're a Baptist or a Charismatic. Make sure you're this or that. He said, no. Follow me. And that's where it starts and that's where it ends. Now, the weapons of our warfare are divinely powerful for the pulling down of strongholds. And I made a quick list here. One of the weapons you have is prayer. I can't overestimate, overstate the issue of prayer. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Praying from your heart about your situation in others is a powerful, powerful tool. It's more than just who's doing the blessing today. You want to do it, Junior? And Junior goes, thank you, Lord, for the food. Well, that's a good thing to do, teaching the kids to pray. But I'm talking about praying, praying. Really start to pray for these situations that are at loggerheads in your family, in your work, in your, in your own personal life. Another tool is fasting. When I say fasting, people say, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> fasting is denying yourself food. In some cases, all you have is water. Just for a period of time to, you know, I guess fasting from your cell phone even. And just separating yourself for a brief time. It's a weapon because it refocuses you. Another is exhortation provoking each other to love and good works. You have the ability, like you did today in prayer, you have the ability to encourage someone. And, and that's a weapon because someone comes in this room today discouraged and you encourage them. You, it's, you've, you've, you've further equipped them. I can do this. Man, it was so good what John said to me. It was, uh, uh, help me. I didn't think I, I didn't even see it. Another weapon you have is praise. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. You cannot literally praise God and have your mind on yourself. If your mind remains on your problems and your life, the praise and direction is on you. But when it moves past you, that you're praising him not because your circumstances are right, but because he is worthy of praise, it becomes a weapon. Jehoshaphat went out into battle and the singers and dancers went before him and caused a great confusion on the battlefield and he had a great victory. 
and he was outnumbered probably 100 to 1. Worship is a weapon. The difference between praise and worship is that worship gets more intimate and you're worshiping God for his character and who he is, not for what he does for you. You're just worshiping God. And it says the Father is going around looking for people that worship him in spirit and truth. The word of God is another weapon. Three times Jesus uses, uh, it is written, it is written when the devil's tempting him. Thy word is truth, sanctify me in truth. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. So the word becomes a director when I get into life. The word that dwells in us richly. Because you read your Bibles, you study your Bibles, you're in Bible studies, you hear the word regularly, it becomes the direction for your life. One of my favorite examples is often that the wounds of a friend are more faithful than the kisses of an enemy. So many times someone's making a decision that I think is really bad. And I watch Christians go, oh, I'm so happy for you, that's so wonderful. Because they want to be liked by that person. But the truth is they're getting ready to go get into a rut. This needs to be examined more so when you come along and you wound somebody by not celebrating a goofy idea, they don't like you anymore. Or they say, you know, you're more faithful than other people that kiss whatever I say because they, they just want to be popular. I'm so happy for you. I've even seen people have left their husband to be happy. Well, I'm so happy that you're happy now. I don't want to give that kind of counsel. I mean, I don't want to get ahead of myself what I'm saying here. I'm just saying being honest is a hard thing. And you can oftentimes, um, people will misread where you're coming from. But it's a weapon, the word of God. And grace is a weapon. We're saved by grace. We walk by grace. Jesus is full of truth and grace. And grace is, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So within grace, humility is a great weapon. When we're arrogant and reactionary and blame shifting, we're in trouble. But when we humble ourselves and say, hey, I don't have all the answers. I'm sorry. Forgive me, please. And we're operating. All of a sudden, God's grace, it's a weapon that brings peace back into the environment. Not, you know, I've been at this a long time, so when I use illustrations, it's nobody in this room, okay? Because you're all so young. But I, I was counseling someone that had been married for a long, long time. They never say sorry to each other. Which leads me to the next weapon, which is forgiveness. It's a weapon. It keeps, and we don't want to be unmindful of the schemes of the enemy who, um, by going to bed angry and sulking, it's a hard one. I'm still working on it, but it, the word's in me. So if I'm angry when I go to bed, or if someone's really, you know, probably the 11 o'clock news is enough to do it. But um, it is, not just the national news. Three people shot in LA. Someone carjacks somebody else. Mother, a stray bullet kills three month old. It's very easy to just get angry. Can't do it. I've got to keep my eyes on him and the sphere he's given me. Another weapon is fellowship. Apostles' doctrine, fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayer. Don't be like some that neglect the gathering of themselves together, as is the habit of some. If you're not in fellowship, you're not in fellowship. If you are, then you are being uh, equipped with your friends and neighbors in such a way that iron sharpens iron and and uh, you know each other, and you weep with those that weep, and you rejoice with those that rejoice, because you're not a lone ranger. Our flesh wants to isolate. We don't want all the complications that come with loose ends of a lot of people. But we're called 
to one body to love one another and to love those that need to know that God loves them. The last one I'm going to put is called God-led accountability. If you're accountable to Noah, if you're accountable, to, who are you accountable to? Yourself? I like Matt Davenport always asks this question: How's that working? How are you doing? One fellow one time he came in and he was his business had gone really bad and he. Um, He's filing for bankruptcy, he, and he, I said, so how are you going to get out of this? He said, well, I'm going to do this and this. I said, wait, wait a minute. He said, who led you into bankruptcy? Well, I did. I said, well, what makes you think that you brought this on that you know how to get out of it? He said, that's a good question. <laughs> we tend to want to just do it all ourselves, but you need these people that he brings into your life not as a crutch, but for edification and building up. And I'll say one more thing about this, is that it's not just for you to get something. It's for you to give something. If you're not in fellowship, you don't make any contribution to anybody that needs that contribution. Getting quiet. So I want to encourage you that those are weapons as we come to the table. God knows what's going on in your life. You're like an open book. I mean, there's nothing, how would I put it? It's like, a, it's like when I used to teach school and the kids would be cheating. What they would do is they just put their book up like this and then they were doing this because I couldn't see their faces. But I could see their pens and passing the tests back and forth to each other. Pretty bad, I mean, they weren't too bright on that. I, uh, but you think that you cover yourself with a fig leaf that God doesn't see you? He sees it all. He knows it. He knows exactly where we are. Really does. I, I promise you. And humility is a great, great answer to these things. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. And cast all your anxiety upon him. For the devil goes around as a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Everything we do is to honor God. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Everything, we're challenged to be alert, but not uh, paranoid and not religious. Someone describe Cooper. Cooper's my main man here. Coop, come on up here for a second. <laughs> I want you to explain to these people what a religious attitude is. Um. <laughs> I'm going to ask you. <laughs> you tell me. No, the first thing that comes to mind is someone who's just inauthentic. That's inauthentic. Can we say? Let's say it for Cooper. Inauthentic. Oh, Give you. us another one. Well, it, I think it all stems from that. I think you're trying to look the part and do these things, but it's not true in your core. Not religious. Is that? Is that, is that good okay? enough? Okay. <laughs> See, I knew Cooper could do this. I played golf with Cooper and his father once, some years ago. We were playing, and I ended up having a golf cart by myself, and Cooper and his dad were in front of me, and then this guy came up with a bag. He said, hey, can I join you? And I said, sure, put your bag on. He said, and said, right when that was happening, there was two really attractive girls walking by. And this guy started talking about the girls, what he liked to do to them, and he goes through this whole deal. I'm just sitting there. And he says, so what do you do? <laughs> I said, I'm a, I'm a pastor. And he goes, praise God. <laughs> praise God. I was a, I'm a youth leader. I won't name the church. I used to be a youth leader at this church. That's awesome, man. We need that. That's really good. You remember, Coop? 
The worst of it was Cooper sliced his first shot, and he said, hey, Coop, you're not getting through the ball. <laughs> and Cooper, of course, Cooper kept his cool. Don't be religious. Be authentic. Don't, I mean, quoting scripture inappropriately is not spiritual. Be joyful. It's your strength. Nehemiah, he says, don't be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Intercessory, I've talked about that. First of all, I urge you in treaties and prayers and petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men for kings and all who are in authority in order that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. And that ties in to, we, we've had this prayer meeting for years. I know Lori and uh, some of the ladies walk and pray together. There's all kinds of organic prayer time. But whatever you're doing, pray. Pray for these situations and, and keep your focus in prayer. It's a weapon. Be God's ally, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's uh, field, God's building. We're his ambassadors. And don't believe um, the lies about your life. If you're getting negative stuff in your life, all the time, it is not from Jesus Christ. You need prayer, and you need to get refocused on what you want to live your life for. Or you can live your life on a bunch of lies that is going to drive you into the abyss. Who here has not had a tough road at times? I would say in a room like this, there's 30, 40 people either directly or indirectly affected by divorce, death, chronic illness, business failures, all kinds of things in our life. Who hasn't had that? We can't let the enemy take what we, where we failed or whatever because like Charles said, rejection is God's redirection. Say it with me. Rejection is God's redirection. He's at work in this. All right, I'm almost there. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. He's got no part in your life and my life. I want nothing of his. When the rubber meets the road, sometimes it doesn't seem like God may be in your area code. Whenever that feeling is there, warfare is going on. And you are a target. There was an old, uh, what was that old uh, comic thing that used to, Far Side, you remember that years ago? And this, uh, this bear was born with a bullseye on his chest. And they said, bummer of a birthmark, Hal. <laughs> because you got that on you. You just can't see it. All right. You ready to have communion? I pray this morning that you're washed by the word. I pray this morning that you know uh, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. There's nothing to be afraid of. Bob Mumford described it as a, like a six-foot wasp coming through this door. That's a scary thing. But if you look carefully, there's no stinger. It's just a buzz and a lot of wings flapping, but it's scary. But he can't do anything to you because you're God's He's been defanged. Jesus crushed his head on the cross. It's finished. You're victorious. He can't, he doesn't have the keys to death anymore. You're going to heaven. You're going to live eternal life. You, he, as, he, those, as Christ dwells in us, all, every, I'm starting to sound like someone else I know. If the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, he will quicken your mortal body. You have resurrection power flowing through you. You have all this opportunity. But like a man who is a scuba diver, you've got to draw on the air or you won't make it. The air's sitting in the tank. All these weapons are there, but if you don't draw on them, then you're just watching 
and you're still a target. And you're going to miss the wonderful things God has for you. And we don't want that. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on them cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah. 